Good morning. My name is Katie Crooks. I coordinate public programs at the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Thank you, everyone, for coming out early this morning for our program. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to the McAvoy Auditorium. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask everyone to silence your cell phones if you happened to bring Including one today. You, um, <laughs> you won't get very good reception down here, but they will ring, and it will surprise you. <laughs> um, also, I wanted to let everyone know that no food or drink, unfortunately, is allowed in the auditorium. So if you snuck coffee in, be good about it and sneak it back out. Um, I know it is early, but unfortunately, that's our policy. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that we are um, live webcasting today's program. So it will be available later online, as well as for our visitors who aren't here today. Um, so we do have two Q&A mics in the audience. There's one there and another over there. So when it comes time for your questions, please do get up and use those microphones so our audience that is listening at home um, will be able to hear what you're asking. And so uh, the panel will ask that you go to the microphones as well. But at this time, I'm gonna turn things over to the president of the JRA, Clemmer Montagu, and she will do the formal introduction. Good morning. I feel like I'm speaking to the choir. I see so many James Werner Alliance members out in the audience. Our organization is a membership organization and our mission is to support American craft and the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Renwick Gallery. That's why we're here today. This is part of our education program, uh, one of many programs we have through the year, and that's one of the programs we do support with the Smithsonian. So with that, I'll turn this over to Nicholas Bell, who will introduce the topic. Thank you very much, Clemmer. Um, I'm delighted to actually be speaking to you today, <laughs> just in the nick of time. Um, I want to thank the JRA for making uh, this morning possible, of course, for another stellar craft weekend. Uh, they do a great job every year. And uh, I also, of course, want to thank the, the Cohen Family Foundation for making the Renwick Craft Invitational Biennial Series of Exhibitions possible. Uh, we wouldn't be here today without the support of the Cohens, so thank you. Uh, we're going to run a slideshow of the exhibition just during our talk. It's just going to loop through. Um, I think it'll help when we're discussing a little bit to be able to see, of course, the work that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, for any of you, of course, that haven't been to the exhibition of the Renwick yet, this is an opportunity for you to get a taste. Um, let's talk a little bit about how the Renwick Craft Invitational is put together. Every two years, the Renwick Curator uh, selects two jurors uh, from anywhere in the country, uh, people that are prominent in the field, and we get together and we talk about a couple of things. First of all, we say, who in this country is working today, is doing excellent work, and perhaps hasn't received the attention that they're due? Uh, perhaps they haven't received necessarily recognition at a national level. Uh, and the other question we ask ourselves is, what are some trends that are going on that might be worth illustrating and, and bringing to the public's attention to uh, help us understand the, the greater picture of American craft? Um, so Ulysses Dietz, curator at the New York Museum, uh, Andrew Wagner, then editor-in-chief of American Craft, and now editor of ReadyMade magazine, and myself met at the Newark Museum in 2009 and began this discussion. And uh, the four people that are on stage with me today were all at the top of the list of names that we brought to that meeting. And when we were looking at these names, a funny thing popped out in our, in our minds, and we realized that there are actually a couple of rather strong themes running through uh, the work of, of, of each of you. And so I want to talk today a little bit about the, those two themes because I think they're, they tell us a lot more about what's going on today. The first theme I'd like to discuss is, is how your work uh, translates out of uh, what you might call the, the history of your media. Uh, most artists working in craft, uh, as many of you know, I'm sure are mindful that centuries of precedent hum, as I like to say, beneath the surface of their work. Uh, but the general acknowledgement does not always translate into in-depth in readings of technical or aesthetic histories. What defines the four of you as a group, I think, is your acute awareness of contemporary crafts antecedents and your ability to employ this depth of knowledge in the creation of original work. Uh, what I think is exhilarating is about that is you're tapping into the riches of uh, different fields of different periods of time and you're able to uh, do that without it being either derivative or nostalgic or uh, that you're able to use it as a tool uh, in your kit, as it were, to create something entirely uh, contemporary and original. So, of course, that's a very different experience for each of you, and I want to address this first with each of you uh, one by one. Let's start with you, Ubaldo. Um, I should also mention, sorry, for any of you 
who aren't familiar with the artists, there's a program and you have, and it has detailed biographies for each. So please feel free to read that for more background on the artist. But Ubaldo, let's start with you. Uh, in your work, it's probably among them, all of you, the one in which history is most deeply ingrained. Uh, you come from a, a long line of silversmiths, and I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that experience and about your background there. My background, it's in Rome, and I'm fourth generation silversmith. But what I try to do in, in my work is basically each one of us has some kind of, uh, I don't know if you can call uh, a primordial aesthetic soup <laughs> which everything has accumulated. So each one of us has a different kind of soup, you know, make it, okay. And my soup comes from a, a lot of traditional um, classical object. I do conserve them as well, but I still try to be true to myself so that when I approach a new work, I'm conscious of all those things, but I try to interpret it being true to myself. So they are a reflection of me today, but considering all the past that mm -hmm. is within my primordial soup, aesthetic soup. Without that, I would be, you know, I could not create. And I think every artist has to look inwards to this kind of uh, archetype that we all have. How much of that came, are we doing okay here? Yeah. <laughs> Bring the microphones closer to the artists and talk to the microphones, don't talk to the victim. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Um, are we able to take care of that? Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about how much of, of your sort of being immersed in that soup comes out of um, your studies, and your studies were very broad, everything from architecture to art history to sculpture, but how much of that also comes out of the fact that your father, grandfather, great-grandfather were silversmiths in, in a shop in Rome, and, and that you were, of course, immersed, uh, surrounded by that through your, your whole upbringing? Yes, but, but uh, I try to make a distinction be between the technical aspect of uh, what we call art or craft or whatever, and the inspiration and creative aspect. They are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, be in other words, it's too close. Yeah, it's closer for you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I um, now I lost con you know what I was saying, but. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that the, the craft does allows you to achieve certain perfection in certain skills. Mm -hmm. But if we, to use a metaphor, the craft is the, is the part that will let you put so many angels on the head of a pin. But the heart is what makes the, the angel dance or sing or whatever you want to do. So those are two different things. From my family, I learned the craft. I learned all those techniques and everything. But the art comes from a subliminal aspect of each one of us in, in this room. So mm -hmm. uh, I find those two things quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I always try not to be defined by the technique. The technique is how you allow yourself to, you know, to, to express what's in your mind. One of the things that always bother me when people say, you are so lucky you work with your hands. And I found that, you know, I work with my hands, but my hands work with something else. It's the, you know, the mind, the brain, the soul, the heart. Uh, you know, I do work with my hands and they're big, but you know, I hope there is something behind and I hope it's my heart. Mm. So, so they're two different things. Okay. okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about also your conservation and restoration aspect of your work, because of course, uh, the, the vast bulk of the work that we see in the exhibition right now is of, of your own design. Yes. But there's also, just as an example, a 17th century Dutch New York teapot here that was, uh, as I think we've put it, at death's door before you recuperated it and brought it back from, uh, from the grave. Um, and that seems to be a, a very large aspect of your work, working with uh, historical pieces as opposed to doing your own designs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, th that started very young. I started restoring for a museum in Italy by the age of 17, 18. So. Mm -hmm and I work with some of the great conservators. Uh, that, that aspect is the one that gives me more satisfaction than anything else, because if you believe in the artist that preceded us, and if you believe in that history, art history, and the, the craft history is a continuum, that's why I like the title you gave to the exhibition, you know, art in, uh, History in the Making, the, it never stops. So basically, even in restoring, you are continuing the same thing. Mm. It's like being a circle, you just go round and around. There is no difference. Mm -hmm. You're just absorbing what somebody else did for us. And then you hope that uh, it penetrates your soul and you're able to somehow, you know, 
give it to the next object, the new object that you do. I don't see differences. I find uh, one I'm taking, and I'm you know, and the other one I try to give it back. You know, that may seem sort of normal to you after all these years, but it's actually quite a refreshing thing to hear somebody say. Well, I mean, it's a, it is a continuum, and I, th I think we are all conduits of the past. No matter what we do, we try to be innovative, you try to be different. Well, none of us lives in a vacuum, of course. No, you know, nothing, everything surrounds us. There is nothing that we, we, we discover things, we don't create them. Mm -hmm. So. Well, it's a nice statement. Yeah. It's Cliff. not mine. <laughs> I borrow it. Okay. Cliff, I think that's actually a nice segue into your work because, of course, you've been discovering or at least attempting to discover uh, the, the, the details of how Chinese ceramics and glazes have been made for 30 odd years now. You talk to me? I am talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> but talk to them. But uh, tell us a little bit about. Uh, how that, I mean, for many of you who know Cliff's work, he was a neurosurgeon before he was a ceramist. And um, I think actually that the aesthetic, if there could be a surgical aesthetic to clay, I think you found it. Uh, but tell us a little bit about how you transitioned into clay and what you've been looking for exactly for the last few decades. The way I look at it, I just started. Is that close enough? Yeah. yeah. I just started in my, you know, career because life, in a lifetime, what, it's gonna take a lifetime for me to master what I'm doing. Maybe in my lifetime, never, in my life, I never achieved to the point I want to be. And uh, sometimes I feel bad because I make a career changes. And, uh, but most of the time, I feel very good, very proud of myself because I was so naive make the changes. <laughs> if I do again, so often I ask myself, maybe not. And uh, I came to this country in 1968, and I thought of it. Roman, romance, because everything so wonderful. I want to be like cowboys, like Jiang Wen, <laughs> chase after Indians. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I got here, it uh, Woodstock, all the movement, and Kent State, and uh, Vietnam, uh, really changed my viewpoints. But I'm Chinese. My parents sent me to this country to get educated. And then I went through all the you know, process, study very hard, and get to medical school, and then study very hard to get myself through the school. And then after that, I worked very hard in the hospital because I'm young. And then I was slaved. Uh, there's, for Chinese, there's no burnout in the terms. I had to learn burnout because I got so tired. I worked for six years, didn't I have a break. So finally, I realized that I need a break, so I took my sabbatical. Before that, I use my spare time, only spare time, only few hours a week to do pottery. I started my pottery career is from my, one of my patients. One day I asked her, and make my early runs in the hospital, I asked her, what you do for a living? She said, I make pots. I said, that's very illegal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she explained to me, it's not marijuana, it's pottery. I said, oh, make pottery. And then she gave me all the 
explain to me what you do and how to do it. For Chinese culture, making pottery is belong to wild kids. You know, the kids are uneducated, live in the country to play with clay. Uh, that's a big no-no. And that's another way I look at the United States. You got freedom, you can do whatever you want to do. There's no class, no, no barriers. And uh, she said, Dr. Lee, after I get out of here, would you like to come to my studio? I will show you what I do. So I took, a, her, took up her offer. I went to see her. She showed me how to make pots. And then she said, would you like to try? I said, that's a very dirty thing. It's going to make me very dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until today, I still wash my hand many times a day. <laughs> Sometimes I reluctant to shake hands with people because I don't want to get germs. And now you know my secrets now. Well, Cliff, Cliff you made an interesting <laughs> statement there about uh, the freedom to do what you want in mm -hmm. this country. Considering that you took up uh, pottery in the U.S. in the 1970s, mm -hmm. you could have gone in a very different direction. I know that you started working mm -hmm. in stoneware. I know that you mm -hmm. started using mm -hmm. American glazes. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there was a, hello, a, a raku mm -hmm. phenomenon going mm -hmm. on, interest in that at the time. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the decision uh, that you made early in your career to look back to China as mm -hmm. opposed to, and, and a very different aesthetic in history mm -hmm. than to what your colleagues were doing around you in Virginia in the 70s. The, the, my, my life story got a lot to do with my decision, what I'm doing now. Really does. And really, um, like, okay, we come very short. I went to James Madison on my sabbatical. That's where I met Holly. I rent a very nice home on the top of the hill. And the kids thought, I have money, I might be a drug dealer. <laughs> but I never tell them what I was doing. And then I did, I volunteered to do a lot of things, like find the kilns. Most of the schools who don't offer students to, do the, to find the kiln because liabilities. But I volunteered to find the kilns to do everything I can, I can, because that's the best way for me to learn. My, after that, second time I went back to, 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 to my following year, my second sabbatical, I decided maybe I shall take up this as my career. When I went back to, to hospital, every time when I see the patients, skull, shaved, made me think about parts. <laughs> I said, uh oh, <laughs> that's dangerous. <laughs> I should make mistakes. So after that morning on, I also my wife is an artist, Holly, the jeweler. I said, I won't want to be an artist. So what's very naive, I just never went back again. Now, I'm, I am still on sabbatical today. <laughs> <laughs> as far as in the early days, my parents was very good collector, Chinese porcelain. And uh, very often, my parents took us to the museums, especially Taiwan National Palace Museum. Unconsciously or subconsciously, I got educated in my memory or visually. So today is my work very deeply influenced for my early exposures. And I'm very fortunate to consider myself, I live in a very beautiful place, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We have very beautiful piece of property. So every day, I live there, or observe, absorb the beauty of the nature, nature beauties. So my work influenced. Everything I carve, everything I do, the shapes, 
like a prickly melon, just like a, the gourd. Every morning you go pick up your, your melons, they're going to prick you because they, got hair, they have a hair, the stems. So I had to work it out how I'm going to do that, achieve that prickly. So subconsciously, my surgical techniques come to play. I say, oh, I can do that. So I did that. <laughs> and uh, they carved in the lotus, the motif, because we have a big koi pond, we have a lotus. So I studied the leaves in the morning, in the afternoon, and late afternoon, then a difference. In the late afternoon, then closed. So I learned a different shape you now from beginning and until in the fall, then died. And uh, I still thinking this beginning for my career. Now I'm still learning. I have very strong desire to be better. And we're going to talk improve. about that desire in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Judith, I want to turn to you. And um, for anybody who's seen your work, and, and even if it's just up here, I think they realize that there are a lot of different worlds colliding in your, in your windows. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet there's, there's definitely a logic to, to the madness, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about influences as diverse as um, gothic art, of course, punk rock, mm -hmm. um, to uh, comic books, uh, to um, all sorts of other things, Victorian morning rituals, et cetera, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about how you take all of these diverse influences from different times and, and, and worlds and blend them into something that is uniquely you. Cliff, I think he's asking you. Ask you? Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd keep going. <laughs> I want to hear Cliff's I'm answer. Just keep, keep <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all right. Um, I don't, there might be a method to my madness, but it's, uh, it's hard to talk about it because I certainly don't have a sense of that myself. I can, uh, maybe with hindsight, there's something, but I don't really plan. I don't know what any of my pieces look like at the outset. Uh, I generally start by sketching, well, sketching is really a generous term, by doodling. Uh, faces, a lot of faces, and uh, whoop, maybe a little too close to that mic, huh? And uh, then I work, uh, if I get a face that's interesting to me, then I attach a body, and the body will, it starts to become some sort of a world. The background of the piece, I don't even draw it out for the most part. I do sometimes. I mean, you can see uh, in the pictures there, there's one sketch that has, is fully done, and one that's just a figure. Mostly, I just I don't even do the, them that elaborate because I want the material to be informing the piece, not and the process. So I start out, and each step influences the next step. So I can't uh, work with assistants very easily or plan ahead even, because I I always want it to be an incredible surprise when it's done. So I I mean I, I'm always looking at stuff and. I look at it, you know, to see if, I, if there's something that I can use, because I am a huge exploiter of everything. <laughs> and um, I don't know. I can't, I, I have no sense of that. I have to be like a neurosurgeon. Well, this is, <laughs> they always plan ahead, hopefully. But this is interesting because I don't think anybody looks at stained glass, of all things, and thinks of it as an improv improvisational medium. That doesn't look like the sort of thing where you just sort of go and, and see what happens. Yeah, you can improvise with stained glass, so there. <laughs> and uh, at some point, you need to make enough decisions so that you can generate a pattern to cut with. Or, um, well, you don't even have to do that. But <laughs> I do that eventually. But I, it's a cartoon. It's not a sketch. So a cartoon is what looks like a coloring book, like a lot of stained glass windows look kind of like coloring book art. So it's just black lines on a white piece of paper so you know where to cut the glass. But it's, I, I think, uh, I don't want to disparage my medium, but there's a lot of bad stained glass out there. And, uh, <laughs> Historically or now? <laughs> oh, any time, but now. And I think uh, 
a lot of the planning gets done in a, a, a reflected light situation, whereas stained glass is transmitted light. So whatever you plan is not what you're going to get. So I think working this way is it's expensive, but it is, uh, it, I think it makes for better work. Matthias, I think um, your relationship with history, as, as for lack of a better term, is actually really interesting because it started late. It was actually not that deep. This is something that happened almost serendipitously with you. And yet it's so dramatically influenced uh, your furniture over the last five years or so. Can you tell us a little bit about what kicked this off? In relation to the history of furniture? Well, I was thinking actually more in terms of the boats. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe boats, but also technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was fortunate in my education uh, early on to learn how to build and learn how to use a computer uh, as a symbiotic relationship, um, which is kind of odd. I don't think that really happened. Uh, you know, that, that wasn't possible to happen 20 years ago. You know, I think that was something that's uh, maybe in the last in the last decade in education now, people are actually learning how to use the computer and how to build hand in hand. Uh, building the boat for me was that happened after I already learned how to use the computer for 3D modeling and after I learned uh, uh, woodworking and metalworking. But the construction of a boat, the logic behind the boat construction is the same logic as the mathematics of 3D modeling. So they, they basically have a relationship with one another. And then building it is, you know, it's another, it's another relationship that works into there. Um, I mean, the, the history of the work, the history of 3D modeling doesn't go back very far, obviously. That's, that's more of a conceptualizing tool and a visualization tool for me. Um, that history is just now being born, you know, really. That, that only goes back maybe 15, 15 years, I think, 3D modeling. 3D modeling for somebody like me to have access to 3D modeling is pretty new. Um, it's pretty expensive software still, but it's, now it's very regular to be taught in educational institutions. Um, so that's kind of interesting. That's a, basically the beginning of history for 3D modeling. Uh, boat building, yeah, boat building goes very far back, and this, the method of boat building that I used goes all the way back to um, the very first boats were basically frames that were covered with the skin. Um, yeah, and the, and the use of steam bending goes back to the Egyptians. The Egyptians were steam bending wood to make stools and uh, benches, uh, you know, very different than mine, but um, they were definitely using steam to bend wood for their ships as well, for boats. Um, I don't know, the, hist the historical rev uh, relevance, I think, to the work, uh, um, I don't know, it really comes down to maybe the, the material in the process, but not so much the forms. I think the forms are a new, it's a, it's a new thing. It's more of an amorphic, amorphic uh, geometry that's becoming really prevalent in architecture and design, the design world. You start to see it in craft, in, in baskets, and things like this. What, what I consider very interesting, and, and this isn't something I ever thought about until your work came along, but uh, the fact that, of course, steam bending has been around for millennia, mm -hmm. and yet that it's had as little influence as it had on furniture design. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's not used much more widely when it, it certainly could have been. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think, you know, for me, the way, the way I see I didn't. I didn't know how to steam bend wood. I've never. I've never tried to steam bend wood until 2006. Uh, immediately after I built the boat. Uh, for building a boat, steam bending was required because the, in each cross section, the, the curves are different, and you don't want to do that with a mold and bending. Uh, it's too much time. So to steam bend wood is very. It's a very fast process. When you want to bend, you can just bend in space. Um, and. You know, I don't know why steam bending hasn't been used more in, in, in woodworking. I think with, with furniture design. With furniture design, the method for bending wood is usually using molds and doing bent lamination, where you have basically build a mold of the curve that you want, and then you glue strips of wood together on top of that mold. And when the glue dries, uh, the wood keeps that bend, and you can make that bend 300, 400, 500 times, exactly the same each time. And you know, furniture in our history in America is a very, very, very short history has been production based mostly. Um, you know, one of a kind handmade furniture in this country is, we didn't have a very long history of that. I mean, it, it started again pretty heavily in the 70s and 80s, but before that, you know, maybe back in like Well, I think as many people in the audience know, it's a tough way to make a living. It's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult way to make a living, especially when it's one of a kind. So, you know, in this country we have a very rich history of the Industrial Revolution and going through production for furniture. So making curves for furniture, you wouldn't really steam bend it in this country. You would, you would do bent lamination because you can make hundreds of curves at one time with one mold. So that could be part of the reason why steam bending hasn't been that 
relevant in our history. Um, I mean, uh, Tonnet, Michael Tonnet in Austria definitely used steam bedding in 18, 1849 for his chairs as for production, but it was definitely a different, um, it, at that, I don't know, it didn't really go beyond Tonnet very well in the yeah, production world. Yeah, but of course, if any of you have ever eaten at a cafe in your lives, you've probably sat in a Michael Tonnet chair. Um, I want to now switch gears a little bit and talk about quality, because this was something that, um, that sort of struck us almost, uh, we weren't, we weren't necessarily looking at your work because it was the best made stuff we've ever seen in our lives. But it was interesting that when we were looking at the larger group of artists for the show that you started to sort of rise up as these people that are absolutely at the pinnacle of your fields. Um, and one of those reasons is because you spend so much time working on the details of how you make your objects. And I wanna, there's actually, I mean, Craft, of course, being a, a field that is very much focused on process, you would assume, and this has been true at different periods of time, that quality is a natural benefactor of that. But of course, there are many situations in this field where, uh, where quality is either shunned or, or not considered the priority or, or what have you. Um, our director, Betsy Brune, made a, an observation that I think is very interesting in her forward to the catalog for this exhibition. She notes that, quote, the margin of difference narrows as they come ever nearer perfection, but still they demand more of themselves, uh, even at the summit. These artists are working way beyond any of our expectations and are focusing instead on their own challenges, however open-ended a commitment this requires. So I don't want to suggest that any of you are looking to make the perfect object. I don't think any of us really know what that is. But there is definitely a quality to each of your works where we can see you pushing yourselves to exhaustion, I'm sure, to make something better, even if it's not something that we're even aware of. Um, I'm thinking of some specific examples. Matthias, the fact that you, for Rivulet, which is one of these larger furniture pieces here, which has 7,000 points of contact between the different strips of wood that you uh, seemingly just for kicks, as far as I can tell, drilled holes through each one of those and pegged them. Um, Cliff, for the fact that you spent 17 years trying to recreate imperial yellow glaze from scratch, um, there, there are superhuman levels of patience here. Um, and I, I'm going to open this up, and please feel free to jump in to, to tell us a little bit about your drive to create works better and better. Life is challenge. <laughs> you give me more challenge, I'm getting stronger. I'm more stubborn. I want to get it. I want to conquer. Just the way it is. I'm type A person. <laughs> no, I can't change it. <laughs> no, I just try to control it. No. Well, and I, for, for your work in specific, Cliff, I think there are a couple of interesting things. The first is, of course, the works that you're seeing in the show only represent about half of your output because the other half you throw away. And I think that's a bit of a shock to people. Um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting for us to realize that uh, your standards are high enough that so much of what you produce, in spite of all of your experience, fails in your eyes. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, the decades you've spent researching specific lasers and trying to create them uh, based on natural ingredients rather than chemical uh, ingredients, and, and what a trial that has been for you. Can you say something about that? My children. They still remember, uh, including my wife. Sometimes they don't see me for weeks. Uh, only time they saw me was during meal time. I was possessed. I want to get what I want. And uh, they're not the only ones with superhuman patience, then, I guess. <laughs> I know, maybe very naive, or maybe. I just don't know anything better. Now, just for the yellow, I saw the one very little piece Perfect. in the National Museum in Taiwan. I always like it. So sub subconsciously, when I start making glazes, I say, I want to get this glaze. And. Uh, very uh, God, very kind to me because give me some different kind of education. I got very good chemistry backgrounds. So I studied NERN, RO, RO2, RO3. And that's a different ingredient in chemistry and to formulate 
the, 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 the glazes. So I went through there. Take 17 years, many tries, I think at least 1,000 parts ruin it. And if any of you are interested in the hands-on gallery at the exhibition, there is one of those many thousands <laughs> that has been ruined that you, can, that you can feel. It gives you a sense of the, the, other, the other half of his production. And uh, what I'm dealing with is also not, not only just organic material. I had to deal with weather. Also, I had to deal with the fuel sources. I don't know if you realize it. Every time you get your uh, propane tank filled, the propane got different in, uh, impurity in it. They are, they are going to affect your outcome, firings. And the glazes, you order the glaze material from the suppliers. They are not chemical grades, they are industrial grades. They have a lot of impurities, they are not in a standard chemical you know, grade standards. So you had to deal with the elements. And also you got dealing with water. The water, you use the water to mix the glaze. There are a lot of impurity in there. You never know what you get. So I had to use distilled water, just like in the lab. And then sometimes the weather is very windy, or either humidity, humidity is very high, that will affect your firing outcome, because I do strictly reduction firing. Reduction means reduce oxygen content in the kiln, they increase carbon content. Carbon content, that's with smoke. That's why you re reduce the, 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 the oxygen in the, in, the, in the kiln. Somehow the carbon molecule get into the chemicals, they make the chemical changed, reduced. Just like a copper, copper would give me in reduction, uh, atmosphere would give me red, or the peach bloom, the pink but the peach broom is accidental. It's not by design. That's why today, you see the antiques, peach broom is very, very rare. They don't come in the big vases, they come in the very small vases, because accidental. I never sell those peaches because I'm pig. I save everything. <laughs> 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 Judith, um, you were talking about um, how long it takes to improvise a window. And one of the things you've told me over, over the months is the fact that these would go so much faster if you stopped taking them apart. Yeah. Uh, I, th I, I dislike the idea of perfection. I'm not interested in, in perfection. But I, if, if it isn't something remarkable happening, I, it, like making something that's OK makes me insane. Absolutely insane. And the problem with. With, uh, with it is, you can only grasp so much, you can only conceptualize so much. So, so you have to make mistakes, and a lot of them, because that's the only way to make anything new. Everything else is just repeating myself. Mm -hmm. And so I have to uh, embrace failure, even though I'm, it's, it's a, a dual-edged sword. You have to fail, but you have to get better. But the one thing you don't want to do is be in the middle, where everything's OK, because that's <laughs> awful. <laughs> it makes me crazy, and it's a good thing I don't have a family because uh, because I I go uh, the I get really nutty. The one that was up there a few minutes ago of the called Dream of the Fisherman's Wife, I made that entirely out of um, a beautiful turquoise glass, a handmade glass from France, and threw it all out. I have a box labeled Bulk Failure. But now I have like 30 boxes labeled bulk failure. <laughs> and I, it killed me. I, I don't know how many hundreds of dollars worth of that glass. And that window is actually made with float glass that you see in the uh, exhibition. And it's heavily painted. But it just looked bad the other way. I, it couldn't, I can't even look at it. It's, uh, aberrant horribleness. <laughs> <laughs> Ubaldo. Somebody actually came up to me last night and they said they were stunned by your work because, and I quote them, nobody makes hollowware anymore. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about sort of the, the decline of silversmithing and perhaps why it is so refreshing to us that you're doing this at all. I cannot uh, explain the social reasons why, but there is a, um, 
a diminishing. Can you hear? There is a diminishing of cultural appreciation of certain things, mm -hmm. as well as the, of the use of it. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, basically you have to climb a mirror against the current. Every all the wind is blowing you down, and you try to grasp and go up. Because uh, uh, silver, there is no demand. There are only very few specific collectors, mm -hmm. <coughs> people that love the medium or they love reflections or they love silver or uh, for a special occasions. But people do not go out and buy mm -hmm. objects. <clears throat> That's the first thing. The second, I think, is the great retailers have lowered the standard to the lowest common denominator. So for that, many uh, they make, uh, basically, they make their money by selling um, the average object is $200. That's mm -hmm. how they make their mass uh, mm -hmm. investments. So I, you have to, to go against society. And perhaps it's time to stop this by doing it at all. There is no sense, you see? So, uh, you <laughs> I have think to there's be, a lot of sense in what you're you, doing. You have to be kind of insane. My mm. only advantage, going back to what they were saying, that I don't throw anything away. I can always remelt if I make a mistake. Mm. And, uh, Sorry, that's not true for you, Yeah. So I actually feel very good when something is wrong to melt it down. It is like <laughs> it's a, a cathartic. A, a cathartic thing. <laughs> They'll teach you, <laughs> you know. You have to suffer now. So yeah. that's it. But, uh, so but I'm, sure that, I'm sure that one of those reasons, besides the, the obvious economic ones and all of those factors, is the fact that it, it is so labor intensive to raise silver yes. by hand. Yes, it is. As some objects that require, and this also, you know, you know, in the past, you go through the Tiffany and, and Gorham archive, and you see that some people employ 40 weeks. <laughs> that's almost a year to yeah. make an object. That is insane. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. Society doesn't allow you to do this. And it's only special occasions and special commission that allow you to uh, investigate at the media. Otherwise, there is no demand. Mm. Unless you create small object, you know, that, uh, but uh, I always classify object in three, you know, three different ways. One is something we do with our hands without the permission of the brain, and there's just the little things we repeat. And then there is the second, we use a little bit of the brain in our hands, and then is the third one in which somebody say, okay, go ahead, make something that you really want, make me happy, or make me sad, or make me there. And then you can use your soul, your body, your heart, your hands, and everything else. But it happens very, very rare, and it is because commissions are not there. Mm. You do not create commission, you create work, but the commissions are there. <laughs> And the freedom is not there, like it was 100 years, 200, you know, 500 years ago. No. Mm -hmm. So it is a sad, sad uh, uh, commentary on society, except now that I come to uh, the, you know, Renwick Alliance, some, suddenly I, have, I found that I was wrong. There are people that are interested. <laughs> you know, so it is... Uh, it is we'll give you his information after the program. <laughs> it, it, it is actually very refreshing. And I actually suggested that uh, I wish there was something like that in Europe. I wish there was a Renwick Alliance in Italy. I wish there was, you know, because the, Clemmer, arts, are, the arts are dying. And actually, we should organize it, you know? Well, Clemmer and David are the people to do that. Yes. Um, so is there, is there <laughs> <laughs> uh, considering the, the, the stress of that, uh, the fact that you're climbing yeah. up, as yeah. you say, is there somebody in the generation beneath you? Is there somebody younger that you see coming up that you hope will carry this on? Uh, you want me to be honest? Yes. No. <laughs> and I do, I do not wish it upon anybody. Hmm. Interesting. It's, it's a curse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a curse because it possesses you, like Cliff and everybody in this room. We are possessed, you know, in other words, this is it. You have not, you know, your life is possessed, imagine. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an addiction. It's, we do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Even when you make a commission, you don't do it for them. You do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. it is, you know, it's, you get a tremendous eye. I mean, you know, I cannot explain it. Uh, I think obsession is a, a very good word, and Matthias Rivulet is an excellent example of that. Amada, the, the very large piece, is another. I think if you look at the beginning of your work, you see experimentation. You see uh, working to see what you can do with the material. But if you look at things like uh, pegging the joints. If you, if you count the number of points of contact, the, the, you're going so far beyond what is necessary to actually support a person, to serve that function. I think obsession is an interesting word for that. Can you, what, do, what do you think? Addiction, addiction is a good word for that. Addiction? Addiction. Um, yeah, but, but the pegging of the joints and the, the amount of intersections, um, it, 
in my mind, they are necessary, but they're, but they're something that is just, is just part of the process. Like, um, I think the drive where it, the thing becomes really obsessive or addictive is even before I was making that type of work was when, when, you're, making a, when you're making a piece you're, and you're, you're um, conscious of the fact that you're actually creating this thing with your own mind, your own body. It's the first thing a thing has ever existed. You're actually in a way giving birth to it or, or, con, or it's like you know, being conceived. Like there's, it starts to feel like an actual, afterwards it actually feels like a friend you know, or something that you created that's, that lives in this world now. And uh, that gets extremely addictive, and especially when you're satisfied with it. That sense of satisfaction feels like a extreme like uh, validity that you're alive, that you're actually able to create these things. And um, when I started making the work that I make now, uh, it was so exciting because it was a fresh take, and I still can't see an end to it. It's, it's, it's limitless in my mind, and not just with wood, with any material that's a linear material, I can make anything I want now. It's just like drawing in space. Um, and with each piece, there's no reason to go backwards. And if you did go backwards, you'd feel pretty, you know, you wouldn't feel so great about it. It doesn't feel like you would, why, why would you keep on making things if you went backwards? So you keep on going forward. That would and, just be okay, I guess, and, as well, Judith would say. It would be okay, but it would also be boring, you know? And it would yeah. be like, you know, you, I, can make, you know, I can make these over and over and over and over again and be okay, but it'd be pretty, get pretty boring after a while. And, <laughs> and the thing is now, like with my relationship with the computer, the computer and I have a definite relationship where the more I, the more I use the computer, the more intuitive it becomes, like a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more it becomes like a sketchbook, the more intuitive it becomes, the more complex it becomes, and so the more it pushes me and I push it. And it's this, you know, it's this weird conversation I have now with the computer where if, if I can make it on the computer, then I can make it in real life. And, well, it's interesting uh, that you say that so because the most more recent complex. piece of yours in the show is called Drift. It's in the Renwick's Palm Court. You, you just finished this weeks ago. Yeah. And you said that it actually had some of the toughest bends that you've done to date. Yeah, this piece, yeah. Boing, there it is. Yeah, and it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine it without, without actually bending the wood. I mean, it, it looks like a fairly simple piece uh, because the more these pieces get refined, I mean, I think this piece it looks very simple. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple, it's, <laughs> Only it's, to it's, you. It's, a very, it's a very simple curve. It's a very simple curve, and so it's a really uh, like refined curve in my head. And that piece was actually much easier to make than the newest piece. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just because of the compactness of the compound curves and forcing the wood to do Something like it, it does want to do it, and it's, if you if you if you if you have a good if you talk to the wood and like it you, it goes in the right place, mm -hmm. but um, uh, that's a very difficult part about it. But the more the more you use the process, the more you learn what the wood really what, wants to talking do. Talking to the wood. Talking to the wood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like like the computer the computer doesn't know what wood is. The computer doesn't know how to you know the computer like uh, can give me an idea of the general geometry, but then when it comes to actually using the material, it's your hands, your eyes, and your experience. Mm. Um, but so if I, it's limitless, it's well, it is limitless because now after making that piece, that piece was tough. But when I was when I was halfway <coughs> through it, I realized actually it's it's not it's not so bad. So now I can make a piece much more complex than that, now, like the next level. Well, and I know that you're obviously at the beginning of your career. You've advanced in in this technique very quickly over the few years, uh, and you have a lot to look forward to ahead of you. I'm wondering if you say it's limitless, what what sort of dreams do you have for this scale? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now it's right now it's very small, but it's small architecture in my mind. Mm. Um, the reason I make furniture and not sculpture right now, I mean, I, I took a hiatus from furniture and I made sculpture for about six months. It's when that tonnet chair, the wrap tonnet chair, came out. Um, and there was, with making sculpture, it was pretty boring to me because there were no there were no uh, rules in making sculpture except for maybe conceptual rules, but no structural rules because it didn't have a job to do. It didn't need to hold body weight, or it didn't need to hold a dynamic load, which would be the shifting of a body on a structure. Um, furniture, the only reason I ever started making furniture was because of the obsession of structure that I have. And um, a bench to me is a bridge. Uh, a, a chair is, like, is under uh, constant compression. And um, all, all these structural principles are why I make furniture. Um, and why the forms look the way they do, it comes from the structural, like the structural explorations that I make and the structural discoveries of using these amorphic forms. Um, the next scale jump would be architecture or uh, pavilions, um, something where I'm, I'm learning so much about compound curve structure and linear curve structure systems and furniture. The next scale up is definitely um, architecture. And that, I think that's like, that's, that would be the ultimate goal for me. Yeah, well, I can't wait to see that either, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just ask you one more question because I've been curious for a long time, and then we're going to open this up to questions. 
this is, of course, an exhibition series that, that looks at people nationwide. And in fact, uh, we've got three continents covered here. Ubaldo's from Italy. Cliff, you, you were from Taiwan originally. Uh, Judith and Matias are from different regions of the country. Uh, it, it seems, I'm wondering if it's coincidental or not, that you all just happen to live within about 80 miles of each other. <laughs> what, what happened that drew you all to eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey? <laughs> I didn't just do that for the registrar's sake, I promise. <laughs> It's a good phone Good phone. <laughs> what? Feng shui. Where do we start? Uh, whoever wants to start. I'm just, I'm, I've always wondered. Well, in my case, it was love. I came here because uh, I met an American girl in Rome at the academy, and she brought me to Newark, New Jersey. Mm. It wasn't by choice. <laughs> <laughs> and she's kept you there all these years. Yeah, and she, made me, she keeps me happy there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would leave New Jersey. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Yeah. That's my reason to come here. Cliff, yeah. how did you get from Taiwan to Lancaster County? I mean, I, I know you went to college, and, mm -hmm. but you also went to, to James Madison in yeah. Virginia. Yeah. What, what was the, the draw of, of uh, rural Pennsylvania for you? Uh, the studio space. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent almost three years go up and down the East Coast looking for a studio because I have five kilns and they are my toys. And I don't have any other hobbies, just work. <laughs> so He's actually an excellent cook. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hobby. And then, and then uh, because wife, you being part of you have such a big kiln, <laughs> and not too many places, they will let you have it, a studio with kilns. So, I think God is very kind to us. Now, finally, we found one in Lancaster County, northeast of Lancaster County. And, and uh, we, uh, my studio is inside the stone barn, two story, almost 6,000 square feet. And uh, my wife occupied upstairs an office and uh, the gallery showroom. Then I almost, almost completely taking over the first floor. And, and then my county, my township is very nice to us. And we can do whatever we want because this, this piece of property is got variance on it. We can do commercial business. And then we don't have neighbors each side because we have very long row frontage and they're surrounded by 200 acres cornfield. And my closest neighbor is a Mennonite right across the street. And that's it. So we are very blessed. So got very less zoning restrictions. That's why I live there. Now I really miss my home because it's very peaceful and quiet. I can get very good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no noise. Can I answer this? Hmm? I think. Uh, Eastern Pennsylvania has, uh, and well, Pennsylvania in general has a very long craft tradition, partly because of the steel industry. There is a lot of metalworking and a lot of furniture. Then the studio craft movement uh, sort of took hold there, and it definitely because real estate is cheap. You can't afford to have a big studio in Manhattan uh, or and the equipment needs. So it's become a real, um, great place. There, uh, Rick Snyderman is here today. Helen Drett all had these incredibly important galleries in the uh, beginning of the studio. Well, not the beginning, but close to it. Uh, craft movement. It's just, it's been a, a real center for this kind of activity. It's, uh, there's many, many art schools there. So what, seven in Philly? Something like that? <laughs> And uh, three so cheers for the U Arts Crafts Program. Is that where I why teach. you went down? Because of course you were. No, I was following a guy. Oh well, <laughs> it happens to the best of us. But I didn't leave. <laughs> and Matthias, you're actually the most recent transplant to Philadelphia. Yeah. You've been sort of all over. Yeah, I'm all over, and I'm looking for the next place now. Um, but I, <laughs> but I, I went to Philly originally. I, I wanted to go back to the East Coast after going to graduate school in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, my choices were, you know, New York was obviously a choice, and uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and Philadelphia. And um, 
what it came down to in Philadelphia was uh, you can get a large studio space for an afford uh, affordable amount of money and uh, affordable living, and, and also a really vibrant art scene. Um, there's a lot of renovation going on in Philadelphia <coughs> that's really, really exciting to see it, it transform. Um, sometimes it's changing a little faster than maybe it should. It's, it's going through really fast uh, transformations, that, good and bad. Maybe they'll clean up the litter. Ma yeah, right, yeah, the <laughs> trash. Um, but no, it's, it's, a, I don't know, it's, it's a fantastic city. And I think it's, it's also, it's a, proximity to New York City is incredible. It's like a suburb of New York City, which mm. is great. Excellent, well. Sorry. <laughs> it, 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 for, for, for the art world, I think it is a suburb of New York City. <laughs> let's, um, let's open this up to questions, and we have a little bit of time here. Please, because this is being recorded, please go to the microphones on either side of the auditorium. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what you, uh, what you have to ask of these, of these folks. You always spend time yes, ma'am, on <laughs> over here. Comes yeah, in Lancaster. Right. Yeah. I was struck in your exhibit. I think a number of people were that you had these lava things that are so different from what we usually think of you as rough. It's not smooth. And I just wondered if you could say a little as to whether that's a new thing or what you were doing with that. Actually, lava. I have been doing that for a long time. But the lava glaze is one of my wife's favorite glaze. Everything I did in the past, Holly kept it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Holly, for releasing these ones. <laughs> but she's my love, I um, you know, love my life. She can have anything I want, I have. You know, so, and, uh, and then my, uh, I say, I, most people think I just do a monochromes. Everything so shiny, so smooth. I say it's time for me to show the world I have other side of me. I can do other things. So not because I want to show off, but I just make it like challenge to me and make two large porcelain vessels. And then the leech nut bring me back in my childhood. It happens Holly's when Holly was in Taiwan, her backyard had leeches trees, and uh, we have leech trees in my backyard. So, just happens. <laughs> on this side. Yes, is this on? Is this on? Okay, good. This is for Matthias. Um, your pieces remind me of, a, of the outcomes of, um, the drawing outcomes of a harmonograph. Are you familiar with harmonograph? No. It's a, a, uh, it's a pendulum, it's a series of pendulums, and um, there's a table and beneath are the pendulums and you can put several weights on these pendulums and they rotate um, in a circular fashion or laterally. And the pendulums are a particular ratio, like a two to one ratio or a, a, a three to five. So it relates to a frequency and the drawings are just like your pieces. I'm going to look that up today then. During, during lunch, I'll look that up on my phone. Say what? <laughs> that, 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 I'm that, sorry. That sounds, that sounds amazing. I'll definitely I'll look it's that up today. fabulous. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I say something about the lava lava glaze. Uh, actually, lava glaze is very very easy to do. If you find a alkaline glaze, alkaline glaze then a softer. Uh, you add one percent of silicon carbide in the glaze, and then of course you got to do some experiments on the thickness the glaze you apply. So you fire in the in the kiln. Uh, both in oxidation reduction in the gas kiln or electric kiln, higher temperatures, the silicon carbide going to put out the carbon, the gas. The gas will go through the glaze, the surface of glaze. That's why I make it like a pit. Knowing Cliff, the fact that it's easier to do is probably why you haven't seen more of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe that there aren't more questions from this audience. You, this is a dedicated bunch. Carl. Good morning, Matthews. What sort of updates or uh, would you like to see to your software? <laughs> Me? <laughs> yes, sir. What, what, what sort of updates? Yes. So, um, improvements. Improvements. Um, that's, a, that's actually that's a really interesting question. Uh, I don't know. If, I, I, don't, uh, I use Rhinoceros uh, 3D modeling software, and it's constantly—they're constantly, they're constantly uh, updating the thing, and uh, it's hard to even keep up with what's 
how much is being updated. What I would like to see for my, for my studio would be update of, of my interaction with the software. Like right now I use uh, you know, two 24 inch monitors to, to work on my work, but it'd be incredible to have a projector on the wall and actually build them full scale on the wall. And th that would be, because I, I, build, I build the 3D models the same way I build the actual pieces. So it's, it's through the same, I mean, yeah, conceptually through the same process. So it would be, it would be incredible to be able to build you know, full scale on a wall. I think that's, that's the main thing. But the software, Rhinoceros, is the tools that I use with it uh, to conceptualize my pieces are the perfect tools to, to, to work with them. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I've, used, I've used four different types of 3D modeling software, and, and, and this is the one that the, 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 other, the other programs don't work nearly as well as this one. So I think it's just, I think I found the right one. But we'll see what happens in the next version. I think the next version is coming out really soon of that, of that, of that program in about six months. Jerry? I, I just want to say I use 3D computer modeling software too, and I wish they'd stop changing it. <laughs> it's like so hard to learn. You don't want to have to relearn it every few months. <laughs> Jerry? Well, Judith, um, in the uh, show at the Renwick, um, with one of your pieces, there's that um, s photograph of the soldier who died in the Civil War, and I take it that that was at least in part um, the inspiration for the piece that, that carries the name of, of that soldier. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about um, where your inspirations come from and um, uh, whether it's historical influences or are there contemporary influences and, and things along those lines? This is going to be such a disappointing answer, so prepare yourselves emotionally. <laughs> um, I don't really have a sense of it. it like the, when Nicholas asked me at the beginning, it's just, an, a, Ubaldo, didn't you describe it as a stew pot? It's a soup. A, a soup. Primordial. It's like a primordial <laughs> soup in my head. Stuff it gets developed very organically. I don't really even know what the word idea means. I just make drawings, and the drawings eventually somehow make stained glass windows. Um, there is certainly no one thing that interests me. I did that piece about John Fletcher Hamlin was about my ancestor. I'd spent so much time doing family research that I hadn't made any art, so I thought I'd better make something, and the only thing in my head was him. So, whoa, there it is. Um, Great timing. To and uh, I also was thinking about the power of the written word. Uh, there really is a letter that she, the mother received that said, your son is no more. I thought, well, that sort of barely begins to express it. And um, I was thinking about that Vermeer painting of the woman at the window reading a letter. Not that I would ever want to really have you dwell on um, mine compared to that, so just don't even go there. <laughs> so it's, it's a mixture. I don't, I don't, I, I can't, I can't say. Sorry. Over here, over here. Um, uh, how, how did you start stained glassing? Is this for me? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I went to college to study oil painting, and I thought that I was going to be an oil painter. There was uh, my grandmother had done it as a hobby, and but we always called her an artist anyway. And I had taken some Saturday classes at art centers, and that's what I would have thought when I went to college. Now, I took the painting program at the college I went to, and the, some of the studios were in the same building as where the stained glass class met, and, and the hot shop as well. And I saw what the, the people were doing, and I knew immediately that I wanted to try it. And when I tried it, it was, it was um, unbelievable, the effect it had on me. I knew right away. I thought, well, I was... Um, pretty young, obviously. I thought, this is the thing that will never bore me. So I learned it in college. There's many places you can learn stained glass, but it takes a long time to, to develop skills. Just for anybody who's curious, that's actually Ubaldo's granddaughter. I thought that was very sweet. <laughs> for disclosure. <laughs> for disclosure reasons, yes. Uh, are there, Chris? My question is really for uh, any or all of you. Uh, going back to what uh, Ubaldo said about 
I think about the, the importance of commissions in allowing for the creation of, of very special work. I'd like to hear from, as I say, each or any of you about uh, do you accept commissions? Do you, do you like them? Do you hate them? Uh, and how do they affect your, your work? I'd like to hear from Ubaldo on that one. <clears throat> I think um, I'm telling the truth. It is a very complex thing because commissions, uh, I said a few nights ago in another, um, to another audience that I am a courtesan. In other words, I had to please the prince and the princess. So no matter what you do, you have to, rela to, re to relate to the person, the commissions you something. You have to walk there in their shoes and you have to try to understand them before you express yourself. Then you throw yourself into, into the project. That is the way I, I, I approach uh, the commission. On the second part, uh, I love commissions. I certainly do not hate. I think that's uh, what everybody needs. In, in uh, a commission with freedom is what we really need, not a commission with handcuffs, as maybe a retailer or somebody can do. Uh, but a commission with freedom is the dream of any craftsman or artist or uh, you know, whatever your job is. Just, just to illustrate that, in fact, uh, in the center of Ubaldo's gallery at the Renwick, there is a fantastic coffee and tea service that's on loan to us from the New York Museum. And in 1984, 83, uh, Ulysses Dietz, who was one of the jurors in the show and one of the, uh, the authors, he wrote the essay about Ubaldo, commissioned that from him with, thank you very much, <laughs> full freedom to do whatever you wanted. He, so yes. He didn't even ask for a drawing. And that is quite unusual. It's very brave. Yes. <laughs> yes, very brave for a curator. <laughs> yeah. But Matthias, that's, what, that's what we need, yes. Yeah. Matthias, you've been doing I think a lot, most of your work through commission since you graduated from school, correct? Yeah, everything. Yeah, Every, yeah every, everything's commission based. And I think the commissions for me are really, uh, I definitely learned a lot more about business going through commissions, which I think is really uh, necessary. The business of art is really um, an eye opener when you get out of school. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of get <laughs> bum rushed into that whole system and the politics, <laughs> the bureaucracy, everything. But, um, but yeah, lately I've been doing mostly architect architectural commissions, so with architectural firms. and. Um, it's great because it, it's 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 a lot of freedom normally. I mean, usually they give me a space like a, a CAD drawing of a space, and I can put that CAD plan into Rhinoceros into my 3D modeling software, so I can conceptualize ideas with the computer and then give them sketches, and um, they can kind of uh, approve like a direction, and then from the direction I can just go ahead and refine it and build it, and it's it's a really uh, it, work, it works great. And I so far I've been really lucky with all my clients that they're they're all. They're all completely free. They just let me do. You know, they give me they give me a little bit of like a spatial constraint, um, but from there, it's the design's pretty much up to me, and that's that's a nice. I I, I don't know. I have nothing against commissions as long as as long as the clients aren't trying to force me to do something. And before before I started making that kind of work, I was making I was I was working with architectural firms and industrial design firms on commissions, but I was uh, basically the the builder. You know, I, I would just I would build what they were designing. And that was pretty rough. And I did that for two years, and that was not... That kind of commission work is horrible, and I think it kills you. But, um, but no, commission work right now. I like commissions. <laughs> I do take commissions, but you got to give me freedom. And uh, <laughs> don't push me. I just <laughs> no, leave me alone. And uh, give me, you know, just maybe two years, maybe three years, okay. maybe never. It's okay. You picked but, a hard medium, you know. No. <laughs> but um, that's freedom I shall have, you know. And uh, if I feel like to do it, maybe in one month. Sometimes I don't feel like to do it, then I don't want to do it. And uh, sometimes in the early morning I woke up, I said, yes, I'm going to do this. Then I go into my studio, just keep doing it until I finish. And then they had to understand, doesn't mean everything I do will turn out. And it will fail 50% of the time. So I will go back to do again, maybe one, year, one more year or two more years. So that whoever want to give me commission had to understand, you know, I need a freedom. Rick, let's give you the last question today. 
Hi, my name is Rick Snyderman. You know, um, recently uh, Judith gave a lecture in Philadelphia uh, at the Art Alliance, and she talked about um, there's, there's high art and there's high craft and there's low art and there's low craft. And um, I thought that there's an interesting circumstance that's occurring here, and maybe the panelists would individually like to address this, but um, for me, there was a kind of comment uh, Bruce Metcalf, who's a very well-known jeweler and critic, and also uh, was one of the co-authors of the book called Makers that just came out, uh, in 1989 wrote something for an Australian journal um, about the nature of jewelry. But he wasn't really speaking about the nature of jewelry. He was, he was speaking about uh, many other things, and one of the things he quoted was a comment of the art critic John Peralt, who said, art must heal. And I thought that was a very interesting insight because I think what we're dealing with and what is interesting in the future, as I see it, is a return to, for want of a better word, let's call it humanism. And I think what the craft movement embodies is humanism. And we've come a very interesting circle to abstraction and intellectualism. And the craft movement is a return to the roots which are about humanism. So perhaps maybe the last question the panelists could comment about that. You want, who wants to talk? By all means, somebody jump in. Well, um, yeah, Rick, testify. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think it has to do with uh, the association with the body, and the, the craft is a real opportunity for uh, mind-body unification, which I would imagine since they're sort of split, that would be healing. Um, I would just note actually on what Judith has said, when we were putting this show together, we, we actually did intentionally uh, focus on the fact that for each of you, your work is something that engages the body. Uh, whether for Ubaldo or Clift, it's something that you hold. Uh, for Judith, it's something that historically refers to a, a, a form of shelter. And then, of course, for Matthias, something that you would actually cradle your body. This was that, that, that visceral engagement was something that we were very much aware of. So I think you, you make an excellent point there. I think uh, it's a double edged sword, though. I think there, there's a word that's come into the vocabulary de skilling that. Uh, People are also suspicious of, of uh, stuff like that. So um, I, that uh, to me is very, very, very dismaying. I never wanted to have any skills, they, but I have been working now for 30 Oops. years and uh, skill kind of happened to me. So <laughs> I've never heard that phrased in such a defensive way you, before. You can't uneat the apple. Well, it's, uh, I see the word and it makes me enraged. <laughs> so I think, uh, yes, humanism, and at the same time, there's it, uh, no. So hopefully, the good guys will win. <laughs> Does anyone want to have the last word here? <clears throat> this is kind of, it's not that I like to uh, reject the premises. On, on the contrary, I think your premises are extremely deep. However, we should have a conference or a symposium on your premises because they are too complicated to be expressed in a second or two. We have to define humanism. We have to define craft. We have to design interaction Good luck. between. So all these things, are, I, I, I would take a rain check. <laughs> it's, there's no an answer, but there's actually an offer to, uh, to pursued the, the subject. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you said that. Uh, clearly, we can only scratch the surface in an hour with four people. But fortunately, every one of these artists will be giving a solo lecture over the next four months. Uh, I don't remember the exact dates, but of course, they're in our calendar on our website. So each of these people will be at their Renwick uh, by themselves, talking in depth about their work and their inspirations. And of course, you can ask them uh, involved questions at that point as well. Please don't ask this question on my lecture. <laughs> ask, ask Cliff that question. <laughs> my lecture is April 17. I will not be ready to answer it yet. <laughs> well, thank you very much to the artists. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 
And uh, I'm, I hope we'll see you all in the galleries at the Rebronic again soon, because the work is, of course, extraordinary. Thank you.